a 19 year old Sudanese girl who was forced into a child marriage at the age of 16 by her father and now she is convicted of premeditated murder, murder of killing her supposed husband. So Nora's story is first and foremost the most heartbreaking story I've ever heard of. And one thing, Nora was only 16 years old when her dad wanted to force her into marriage and she was really against that and as much as she tried to, she wouldn't just take no for an answer. So she wanted to focus on her studies, so I believe that the marriage wasn't even against the man himself, but just to the whole idea of getting married and not you know, accomplishing what she has planned for herself. So Nora was very ambitious, she wanted to be a teacher and she wanted to focus on her studies and 16 year old is, is a very young age to be married at. And so. Um, he insisted on the wedding and she had to run away. She ran away from home and she, sta she stayed with her aunt for three whole years. And after those three years, her dad contacted her and he told her that the wedding would be cancelled since she didn't want it anymore and it was safe for her to come back home. So you can imagine after not seeing your family for three years, Nora was really like she really wanted to get back home. And so she did go back home and just to realize that she had been tricked and the wedding was still going to go on. And she found that everything was prepared, the wedding was prepared and the man was there ready and everything. So. She really didn't want that to happen and at that point, what can you do? Because the wedding is right like it's tomorrow or like whenever it is and there's nothing and everyone is like keeping an eye on her so she can't run away, what can she do? And so Nora was taken by her new supposed husband and it's not even a husband because all that is void. And um, he took her for the honeymoon to the city of Khartoum and then for a few days Nora refused to consummate the marriage. She did not want to have sexual intercourse and he kept forcing it and she did not want it. So after a few days, he ended up calling on his cousins and brother to come and hold her down. So they beat her and they held her down for him to violently rape her right in front of their eyes. Can you imagine the humiliation of that? And so he stripped her and you know, he raped her very violently in front of them. And then the next day he tried to initiate contact again and she really didn't want that and she kept telling him to stay away from her and he wouldn't listen. He kept forcing himself on her and then um, Nora took a knife and then as much as she warned him he would not listen and in self-defense she stabbed him twice and she ended up killing him. And so in that state of shock she ran back to her dad and she told him that these are the events that unfolded, this is what happened. And do you know what her dad did? Her dad took her to the police station and he handed there and he said that he disowns her, that that is no longer his daughter and he doesn't want anything to do with that. And then him and the rest of his siblings and his wife, they all moved out because they were scared of like backlash from the community because they were looking at their daughter as a murderer, not as someone who was brave enough to defend herself. And so he took her to the police station and now Nora has actually been in jail for a whole year. And that's what people don't know because this story only started becoming you know, it only went viral just a few weeks ago, and that's because that's when they gave her the death sentence. Um, so in the city, in the country of Sudan, um, murder is is punishable by death. So she would be hanged to death if she was convicted by that, and she was convicted. And so for a year, she's just been um, in jail, just awaiting all these trials that are ongoing. And yeah, so they said they decided that it was premeditated murder, and then now. Um, on the 10th, as from the 10th of May, they decided that the, her legal team had 15 days to appeal um, for a retrial. And so at this point, we really just want to help. So this is how we're going to help. Great, thank you. So what really both got you motivated and um, got you really involved in your story then? So personally for me, I am very passionate about people's rights and human rights in general. This isn't about feminism. This isn't about Muslim women. This isn't about even black people or Africans. This is about a human's basic rights not to be forced into a marriage, not to be raped, not to be convicted as a murderer in self-defense. So what motivated me really is the fact that this is a human being who represents so many other people in the international system, which is why we have come up with the hashtag, hashtag more than Nora, because this isn't just about Nora the individual. This is about the many women, girls, children who Nora represents and whose stories never surface on the media and never get international headlines. I couldn't have said it any better. I totally agree with Hoden. I believe in the same things that you believe in. And I believe that Nora was somebody who really got the worst treatment. I think that the background did not really support her. I think the court might have even taken advantage of her because they knew this person does not have family. Her family disowned her. She clearly does not have any money. She has no support from anybody. 
and honestly I really think that Nora must have been a really really good person for her to really be getting can you imagine like how many people are now talking about this hashtag so many people are in Nora's case so many people are trying to support there have been peaceful protests around the whole world everyone is just supporting Nora so I believe that this story isn't even just as Hoden said it's not just about being a woman or about being Muslim or anything like that this is just basic humanity and I believe that this story has touched so many people and the story has touched just too many people for it to just go by unnoticed. And also, it's not she's not the only one. That's why we had that hashtag for more than Nura. She's not the only one. So. Thank you so much. Nora. So, what would you like the international society to really take away from your case? I think what we as individuals would like the international society to realize is that our just go just to get that audio. what a lot of the activists and normal people involved in this and who are tweeting about this and in outrage want for the international community to take away is the fact that Nura is not just Nura. Nura is millions of people. Nura is the broken judicial systems that we have. Nura is the cultural uh, barbarism, if I can say, that we have instilled in many, many cultures and the patriarchal acts because if if a man were to kill his wife, if we reversed this case and Nora's husband had killed her, he probably would have just paid a dia to her family and it would have been over with. No one would have spoken about it again. But because she's a woman, and because our patriarchal societies have raised us to realize that women must keep quiet and women, women aren't allowed to speak up about issues, we need to realize that women should be empowered more. And especially in the 21st century where we speak about women empowerment and equal rights, this should be at the forefront of what we speak against. I feel the same way. Um, also, one thing that we should talk about is that in trial, um, by the Sharia law, it was, um, you know, they get their blood family, so they get um, the man's blood family and they bring them to court after the judge has already decided. And then, if anything that can change the verdict of that, it's the blood family. So they brought his immediate family, that means his parents and his siblings, and they brought them to court and they had to decide between a deer and the execution. And the deer is basically the financial compensation, so she would have to pay for that. And I believe that money would have come out of people like us, people who are donating over all over social media to help her. And so they had to ask, um, was it Dia or was it going to be? And then for that last trial, there were so many people at her court. So many people came and sat. They were it, they filled the court so much. There were people who were actually standing outside in the street. So they asked them, and then the judge, um, no, they ca they called one of the lawyers, and he came and he just said all the story, like from the beginning, this is what happened, this is what led to this. He said the whole story. And then he gave it to the judge, and the judge asked the media family, who said, okay, so this is your choice now. And as much the judge's job is actually to convince them to choose otherwise. He wants them to take the deal. He doesn't want them, you know, to execute Nora. So he asked them, you know, like he was telling them things like, if you show mercy now, God will show you mercy when you need it, all that kind of stuff. And they insisted on that execution. They insisted that it was going to go by, and she was going to be hacked for her actions. I think there are people speaking up about these cases, especially because of the um, women empowerment and feminist climate that we live in right now, but I don't think there are enough voices speaking up against this. I want women to be able to scream at the top of their lungs for their rights, and I want girls to grow up knowing that if my father tries to marry me off without my consent to a man, I have rights, and I live in a state that defends my rights, and I live in a world that looks at me because I am a human being before I am a woman, before I am black, before I am Muslim. I want young girls to realize because if Nora is executed, if, if all of the protests going on internationally fail, young girls in Sudan, in Somalia, in Asia, in globally will start to see that, oh, if I try and stand up against a man like Nora did, then I will get killed. So there's no point in me trying to stand up against my own oppression. There's no way we can emancipate young girls from this ideology of you are less and you should be submissive and a man owns you if we do not stand up for people like Nora. That's totally true. And one thing is that, first of all, the stories that we're going to talk about, we talked about child marriages. First of all, it should not be allowed anywhere. To be, to, to be able, even if you have consent, because I believe somebody at that age can't be making the right decisions. I'm 19 and I still make some very wrong decisions. So somebody at 16 years old, do you think anyone like that should have been married in the first place or even given the idea of marriage? But that's just the problem with so many societies in the world. They teach girls that that's all you have to look up to. That's all you should aspire to be. You should aspire to be a 
wife and you should aspire to be a mother and that's all there is to you but that is not true there's so many opportunities in this world for women and there's so many things that women can do better than men and they they will not be able to do those things if they're not given that chance another thing is the forced marriages forced marriages at any age should not should not be happening because that's a decision that you could potentially be making for the rest of your lives you're giving your daughter to somebody who she's going to and you don't know this person you don't know what they're capable of you don't know how they're going to be treating your daughter and you look at this person and you think this like her father for example that was his little girl like this was someone who was running around the house such a young age and all of a sudden he could trade her like she's so in poverty and that's so wrong and another thing about the marital rape is that people don't realize that marital rape is a crime there are so many countries that do not recognize marital, marital rape as a crime and so if it's not crime then she should not have defended herself so if we do not start with recognizing marital rape as a crime we will never be able to justify Nora because she would not defend herself if it wasn't a crime also something that I, I think that I should add on to that I just remembered. I read an article yesterday that a few days after Nora's story started blowing up out, onto the internet, a similar case came up, but a very interesting case because um, a girl in Sudan decided she wanted to marry one of her distant cousins and she wanted to marry him and he wanted to marry her. And her father and close relatives were against the marriage. So they went away to a different city where their extended relatives agreed to the marriage. So primarily her and the husband who got married uh, the sheikh who married them off, and um, the, the dad went to a criminal court and a sharia court in Sudan. The sharia court said that obviously because she consented and the man consented, there's nothing they can do. Mm -hmm. But the criminal court said that no, she went against her wali, her father, so she and the man must be punished. And at this point, when the criminal court came to their decision, she was already a child, meaning she was seven months pregnant already with their firstborn child. So. Um, in the article it said that the woman was supposed to receive 75 lashes and six months in prison and the man was to get one year in prison and a hundred lashes. Um, I think two days ago she received some punishment. But the thing is we need to understand that we need to balance out our judicial systems because we claim to be in systems that are equitable and fair and cater for everyone. But if they take her father's needs above what is Islamic law, which Sudan and a lot of Muslim countries are supposed to prioritize and say that her father's rights matter more than her husband who she just married and I heard that also the witnesses who were, came for her nikah were banished from society and the sheikh was stripped of his titles who had given them the marriage so we need to really start these conversations and spark up these conversations because people in those remote areas where this happens are too scared or they've lived in that community for too long to the point they're like, oh, this is normal. So when they see us discussing this in the international community, they're like, hmm, maybe there's something wrong with the way we're living. Maybe this isn't how people should be living. Okay, so to support Nora's story, we're going to be following in the footsteps of many peaceful protests that have taken place around the world. We had a protest in the U.S., two in the U.S., and we had in the U.K., we had in Australia, we had in Tunis, and now we want to have a very peaceful protest here in Nairobi, Kenya. That's going to be taking place on Saturday, the 19th of May, and that's going to be in Uhuru Park, Freedom Corner, starting from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And just for everybody watching this, we want to ensure everybody that it's going to be a very, very peaceful protest. For all the parents that may be worried about their children, for any minors that want to attend that are scared of what could happen, because maybe there's been a history of maybe some protests that have gone wrong. But for us, first of all, we're not going to be marching. We're not going to be blocking any streets. We're not going to be causing any chaos. Simply, we're going to have a few speeches made, and we're going to have a photo and video session where everyone is going to be holding up a placard that says justice for Nura and more than Nura. And we can say, you can start with saying, uh, my name is this and that, and I support Nura because, and a very short sentence, why you support Nura. So we're going to have that photo video session. We're going to have very encouraging speeches by many human rights activists. We have um, Kenya Human Rights Commission taking place. We have the, the most thankful support to Amnesty International, who also going to be supporting us for our protest. We also have a journalist, a very well known journalist, slash human rights activist, Mr. Faisal very, very strong speech, I can imagine. We'll also be able to speak with all the talk. We'll also open the door to all the families to their families. And we hope that this can get a lot of people to it. We hope that this can get a lot We really want this to get to someone who has the power to make it We really want the judge himself to open the TV and be able to see the whole world just against this and have to
it to ask about this decision. So we're not asking for that. Honestly, it's not like we ask if we want new or new or release to brand out. That's not what we're asking for because we also want to be watching. Okay, thank you. I believe that Nora should not be convicted and also I believe that Nora when she gets out, she should be having people speaking to her. She should have a professional who's going to talk to her and help her out with the trauma that she went through. Because Nora is a child, 19 years old. This girl should not be treated as a criminal. We're treating her, there's so many mass murderers that have gone walking free and we're talking about someone who defended themselves and now she's being convicted. And so. One thing is that women always feel so ashamed to come out of these topics. It's so much more shameful to be a rape victim than to be a rapist. And I've never understood the mentality of that. The, vic the rapist commits the crime and the victim is now the one feeling bad about it. Women feel so scared and even other rape victims, they feel so scared to come out and say, I have been raped because they feel so humiliated and so ashamed to say something like that. But we really need to make this topic go out. And if we, somebody said that if Nora does not get a hand, that's going to give an excuse to every woman to defend herself and she can go to any extent. But if we're going to think in that same mentality, we can also say that if Nora does get hanged, it gives every husband an excuse to treat their wife the way they want to, to force her into whatever she doesn't want to feel like, and she will not have any say to say about it. So we really need to defend just not just Nora, everybody else. We need to do this for our future daughters and granddaughters. We have to help everyone. And I believe that this story will also motivate more people outside. Maybe if they feel like Nora came out as a rape victim, so many people will be motivated to also say the same. Also because we live in an era of Me Too and women um, pronouncing that they've been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted, we like to live in a bubble that those women who have said Me Too are the only ones who have been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize that especially in our culturally ingrained societies, women have been raised to keep quiet, to never speak up, to always make sure that they keep their heads down. Women are to be seen but never heard. And the thing is, when women are in these depressive and, and mentally unstable states because if you have been physically violated and also emotionally and mentally violated, you, you carry that sexual violence with you for the rest of your life. And the thing is that people don't realize that these women don't just need therapists, they don't just need people to talk to them, but they need to be stripped of stigmatization. They need to be stripped of the shame and, and embarrassment that comes with being raped. Women need to start being educated. like civic education on the fact that being raped does not mean that you are different than anyone else. Being raped means that you are a victim of something horrible. If someone is robbed, they aren't looked at differently. Why is a woman who was raped looked at differently than someone who has been robbed? Our community needs to change the way they look at women who have been in these situations and also the way that we assist these women because we put these women in, in therapist classes, we don't put these women back into work, we don't put them back into the community as normal people, we don't let them live past the fact that they've been raped. So if we could move forward with the fact that our cultures need to change and need to change now, we would do so much, not just for Nora, but for all the women who are in similar situations. What's the hashtag you use? Hashtag more than Nora. We, we came up with hashtag more than Nora because a lot of the times when we say justice for Nora, people would speak up and say, oh, you're only speaking about that one serious girl. Yeah, it isn't just her. Why are you only speaking about her? This is a feminist thing. This isn't about humanity. But we say hashtag more than Nora because it's not just about Nora. It is about the millions of girls and women. It is about the millions of men who oppress women and think that that is the way of life, that you are being masculine and being the man by hurting women. This is about the traditional systems that are broken. This is about judges who are afraid to speak the truth because if judges speak the truth like the one in DRC a few days ago, you'll be sprayed with bullets and you're going to be in a, in a hospital for God knows how long. We need to start fixing the cracks in our system and we're only going to do that when we realize that a singular person's problems is not just reflecting on them but also reflecting on our global community. So we say more than Nura because this isn't just Nura, this is the world we live in. It has a ripple effect. If this happens to Nora, we let it go by. It's going to happen to more women and more women, and we won't be able to put a handle on it. So we really need to make this stop right now because we we're not going to motivate this anymore. We're not going to tolerate it anymore. Enough is enough.